Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Before we left Calhoun, Georgia, the people asked us, where are you going? And I said, we're going to Canada, Toronto. Well, do you have family there? And I said, yes, a spiritual family. And that's why we're here this morning. You know, I have two sets of families. About a month ago, my wife and I took a month and took a long trip up to Chicago to see our oldest daughter, and then up to Minnesota, to Twin Cities, where my youngest daughter lives. Spent a few days in each place, and then went up to Manitoba, where I got a brother. By the way, I wouldn't mind if you prayed for him. He's not in the faith. But we had a visit with my brother and relatives, family there. In fact, we had a reunion in southern Manitoba of my blood relatives on my mother's side. Over 100 came together, cousins and so forth, big family. And then we went over to Saskatchewan, where Joyce's siblings got together, and we had a, several days there together. So then we reversed our order, by the way, came back down the opposite to Twin Cities, Chicago, back down to Calhoun, Georgia. So when they asked me, are you going to Toronto? I said, yes, family, the spiritual family of God. What a privilege to be part of such a wonderful family. And that's why we're here, because we believe that God's family is more precious than anything else in the world. In fact, we're closer to most of you than I am my own brother, who's not in the faith. That's tragic, isn't it? And all those relatives that got together in southern Manitoba, I was the only, my wife and I were the only Adventists in the group. Now, many of them are Christians, praise God for that, of the Lord, and um, they have a good heritage, but it's still not quite the same, is it? Not quite the same. Again, so nice to see so many of you that we've known, and it's nice to have a baptism today. Praise God. I'm glad Pastor Godsell had a special young man being baptized, and I'm glad Muser was baptized this morning as well. The title of my message this morning is entitled Transformation. I was reading an article some time ago in the Adventist World magazine. I think you'd likely get that one. Adventist World, an article by Klingbell, Gerald Klingbell, one of the editors of the Adventist Review. By the way, I like his editorials very, very much. And he had an article entitled Transformation. By the way, that's where I got the inspiration to title my message this morning, Transformation. But in his article, he pointed out that in 2017, 23 million people, did you hear what I said? 23 million people were so dissatisfied, evidently, with their looks outside that they decided they needed to have a transformation. And they had facelifts, liposuction, working on their eyelids, um, abdominoplasty, breast implantation, you name it. Cosmetic surgery, 23 million people, 2017. By the way, I was interested, he didn't point this out, but I knew this from other information I've read. The countries that seem to do this the most is South Korea, and down in South America. Yeah, I see the head nodding. South Korea and Brazil. Now, we do a lot up here, too, of course. In the United States, the beauty and cosmetic 
market was expected to exceed $62 billion. 2017. That's $191 per person on an average. What? I certainly don't spend that much. <laughs> wow. Globally, the market is expected to reach US dollars, 675 billion by 2020. People want to change their outward appearance, and that's all right. I'm not, by the way, I'm not knocking all cosmetics, and I'm not knocking all of that, what they do, if some of it may be necessary and so forth. So I'm not knocking that, but the point I want to make this morning is I certainly would desire that we'd have the same desire to change where it really counts on the inside. Amen? Amen? You know, we can change the outside. We can put on a suit and a tie and a big fancy dress and we can really dress up. But are we concerned about our hearts? You know, we look at the Word of God, man is tempted to change. That's a common thing that's been happening for way, way back. In fact, in Genesis chapter 6, before the flood, in Genesis 6, verse 1 and 2, by the way, chapter 6 tells about the flood, when God decided he'd had enough and he's going to start all over again. Wow. You remember in Genesis 6, 1 and 2, it talks about how the sons of God, the followers of God, were so caught up in outward beauty that they married the daughters of men, just for their beauty. Now, all women want to be beautiful, and I don't blame you. You are beautiful, by the way. Most of you are very, very beautiful. But evidently, they had things out of proportion as well. Amen? Because they were giving up their worship of God marrying unbelievers just to be beautiful, to have a beautiful wife. In Genesis chapter 11, you have the story of the Tower of Babel. And you know the story. This time, this society decided they were going to change the whole society, not just individuals. And so they were going to build a tower to make a name for themselves. So if another natural flood came along, they didn't believe God sent it evidently, they would be able to escape. They could climb up the tower and save themselves. Well, how foolish. How foolish indeed. Well, God came down and confused the languages, and they'd be getting more and more confused all the time. <laughs> right? But man's desire to control things themselves, but not in harmony with God. You know, through the years, generals and rulers have sought to change society through conquest and war. Nebuchadnezzar, Alexander the Great, Napoleon, Stalin, Hitler, on and on. You could just keep naming them. Tried through force to impose on society their ideas of what society should be like. And they failed. And they all failed. But then we have Jesus. Wow. We have Jesus. Using another way to bring transformation. A way that I'm recommending to you this morning. But it's the way of the cross. The sacrifice of Jesus. Hear this one man, born in an obscure village, raised in another village up by the Sea of Galilee area, Nazareth, 
a man who never wrote a book, never sought earthly government position, but gathered together a ragtag group of men called his disciples. This man so threatened the society of that day that they said they had to get rid of him. And you know the story of the cross. Wow. Wow. Christ's kingdom is certainly different than the kingdoms of this world. Totally different. Totally different. Ellen White, writing in Christ's Object Lessons, talks about the principles of Christ's kingdom and compares it with the kingdoms of this world. She says, its principles, the kingdom of God, its principles of development are the opposite of those that rule the kingdoms of this world. Earthly governments prevail by physical force. They maintain their dominion by war. But the founder of the new kingdom is the prince of peace. Praise God. Praise God. The Holy Spirit represents worldly kingdoms under the symbol of fierce beasts of prey. Now, if I can digress a little bit, you remember the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. The kingdoms Babylon, Peter Persia, Greece, and Rome, represented by a. What were the kingdoms? Lion, a leopard. A lion, bear, leopard, that big strong beast, that ten horns. Yes, the kings of this world, ooh, they use force. They're, they're bird, animals of prey. Wow. Wow. But Christ, reading on now, is the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God. Not a beast that's going to conquer through force and no. the Lamb of God. Christ implants, puts in, not externals, though we do change externally too. Christ implants a principle by implanting truth and righteousness, he counterworks error and sin. Wow, what a difference, what a difference. Napoleon, who certainly tried to inaugurate his ideas by force, by war, recognized that Christ was vastly different, vastly different. Napoleon is reported to have said to General Bertrand, I know man, and I tell you, Jesus Christ was no mere man. He was right. Then he went on. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I founded empires. We wrested the creation of our genius upon force. But Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love. And at this very hour, millions would gladly die for him. It's still true. Isn't it? And I believe many of you would be willing to die for Jesus too. Am I right? I hope I'm right. That's why you're here. Amen. You live for him. You're willing to die for him if need be. And the principles that he represented here on earth. Wow. Isaac Watts caught it all very well when he wrote that beautiful hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ, my Lord, all the vain things that claim me most I sacrifice them to thy blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, 
Sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? And then he said, Oh, where the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands what? My soul, my life, my all. Oh, that's the problem. You see, Christ's kingdom makes demands too. He wants to change us from the inside out. He doesn't want us to be the same. Well, he takes us the way we are when we come to him. Praise God for that, amen? But he doesn't leave us the same. Uh Uh-uh. Not for one moment. So how does this transformation take place, this true transformation? How does it really happen? Well, I can't fully explain it, of course, but I want to make some recommendations this morning. And I have a feeling that many of you here today are going through some real struggles. Some of you are trying to maintain your faith and you're having a very difficult time. Every once in a while, I hear of somebody who leaves the church, gives up on the Lord. So how sad, how sad. And somehow they're missing something. Why are they turning their backs on Jesus? But it's happening. What has gone wrong? People, I find, often are hopeless, discouraged, hurt. And something happens and somebody offends them and they walk away. Well, if you're in that category or whatever category you are in this morning, I'd like to suggest there's hope for you in the Lord. Don't walk away from him when you're going through hard times. Run toward him. If you're discouraged, don't walk away. Go to Jesus. Whatever you're going through, tell Jesus. He can handle it. He can look after it if you let him. But that's where the secret is. We need to spend time with Jesus. Don't get up in the morning and rush, have your cup of coffee and run off to work. Take time for prayer. If you have to get up a little earlier, do it. Go to bed a little earlier so you can get up a little earlier. But take time to talk to Jesus, read his word, pray, do a little studying, time. Oh, contemplate what Jesus has done for us and what he's doing and willing to do if we let him. If we'll let him. Keep looking to the cross and the love of Jesus. Remember that? I'll I said by the cross. Keep looking to it. Keep looking to it. You know, conversion takes place when a sinner recognizes that they've sinned against the Lord and they recognize that God loves them despite their sins, despite their failures, despite everything that's gone wrong, and they go to Jesus. Their lives are changed. And our lives keep being sanctified, grow by the same thing, running to Jesus day by day, going to Jesus every day. I want to tell you a story this morning, a true story. 
Last August the 30, no, last August the 26th, a little over a year ago, I had the privilege of standing in the baptismal tank in Calhoun, Georgia, and baptizing a young man. Oh, I guess he must be in his 40s. That's young, isn't it? From my age, that's really young. Amen? Amen. Anyway, I had the privilege of baptizing a young man. Oh, his name, his first name is Rodney. Rodney. Rodney grew up in a Baptist home. Quite conservative parents, Christian home. Went to church. But like many young people, when he got into his teens, he wanted to try the world. The world offers so much, the glamour, all those cosmetics. And he got into drugs. And an alternative lifestyle. You ever heard of that? That's the term they use today. You know, you got an alternative lifestyle. Gay lifestyle. His conscience bothered him so much. Finally, he couldn't take it any longer, so he stopped the gay lifestyle. But he still had that attraction toward men instead of women, the way God planned it. He went to a doctor's asked for help, they couldn't help him. He went to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist said, you're fine just the way you are, it's just an alternative lifestyle, what are you fussing about? Just accept yourself. Maybe that's true in some cases, maybe we need to do that, I don't know, God doesn't work always the same way. Sometimes we do have to accept what we are, but. Psychiatrists wanted to put him on depressants and medicine. But he got so disgusted, he left the medicine and walked out. Rodney had tried to get away from his past, but it was eating away his guilt. And finally, he came to the place where he said, I've got to end it all. And he made a plan. And one night at about 11.30, he pushed back his bed in a small room, took a rope, tied it to the fan, the ceiling fan with the light ceiling fan, tied it to the fan, and Rod stood on a chair, tied it around his neck. Going to end it all. And with, can you imagine him standing on that chair now, a rickety chair, one of these folding metal chairs, you know? And the chair went flying, and as he fell, he prayed, oh God, help me. And he found himself on the floor. He thought he was dead. But Jesus spoke to him and said, I love you, you're my son. And all you needed to do was ask. That's pretty simple, isn't it? All you needed to do was ask. And Rodney, there on the floor, he didn't know if he was alive or dead, but poured his heart out to Jesus, confessed all of his sins, invited Jesus into his life. Lord, take my life. Please forgive me where I failed. Gave it all to God, to Jesus. And then he began to realize, wait, I'm not dead. <laughs> I'm alive! And the 
rope. It was around his neck, and the fan was now in a coil on the floor. And he got up. Praise the Lord! I've been saved! Jesus has accepted me. I'm converted. Praise God, I'm saved. And you know, the Baptists always say, I'm saved, I'm saved, you know. Hallelujah, I'm saved, which is all right. He was. He was so excited. He went out in the street yelling. This is now midnight. I'm saved. Hallelujah. Jesus saved me. Can you imagine? And people began to come out of their houses. What are you doing? You're making all this noise. And he told them, well, come and feel me. I'm alive. And Jesus just saved me. And he made so much noise praising God, he couldn't stop. Someone called the police. And the policeman came and asked what's going on. And he told the policeman what he had just done, what happened. The policeman gave him a hug. Gave him a hug and said, but you better be quiet till morning. <laughs> better be quiet about your salvation till morning. <laughs> Amen? Wow. Does Jesus still save? Of course. You're my son, my daughter. All you have to do is ask. Wow. Now, Rodney still has some struggles, but God has delivered him. He has no more temptation toward that gay lifestyle at all. It's gone. Now, I'm not saying God always does it this way. Don't misunderstand me now this morning. I'm telling you a story, and I've met other gays that God does miraculously change them right like that, that are still sincere. So please don't misunderstand. I'm not condemning. I'm telling you what Jesus can do. All we need to do is ask. But we need to do that every day. Did you hear me? We need to do that every day. Get down on our knees and admit that we can't change our own lives. We can't control our own destinies. And ask Jesus to keep coming into our hearts. What do you say? It's that simple. But take time to do it. Take time to do it. You see, the work that Jesus gives is from the inside. And it comes bubbling out like Rodney couldn't contain himself. I'm saved. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, from the inside, and then it works out. Now, the passage that I asked to have read this morning for our scripture reading was from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want you to turn to the Word of God because I'm here to share the Word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And you know verse 17, of course, most of you from memory. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ. Now, wait a minute, don't go any further. How do we get in Christ? Well, let's turn around. It really means that Christ is in us. We're in him. He's in us. We have a relationship, a union. Wow. If any man be in Christ, he is what? Well, the scripture reading that was read this morning said, creature, Right? I like the New King James Version where it says, a new creation. A new creation! The great creator God changes our hearts. The same power that brought this world into existence is the power that changes us from the inside out. A new creation! Wow! What a God! What a God! And notice it said, if any 
man or anyone, anyone says, man or woman, doesn't matter. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become what? New. 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 We have a marvelous God, don't we? What a marvelous God. If we spent just a little time getting to know him, he gets more wonderful all the time. The older I get, the more wonderful Jesus becomes. Not less. But you know what I got to keep doing? Every day. Every day. Getting down on my knees, opening the word, praying and talking to that wonderful Lord. Every day. Ellen White, in her book, marvelous book, Steps to Christ. By the way, I think we should read that book about once a year. Have you read it recently? If you haven't, dig it out and read it. It's the most wonderful book ever written on how to be a Christian, other than the Bible itself, of course. Amen? I, I say that without apology. It's a marvelous, marvelous book. We need to read it at least once a year. In that book, page 70, she says, By faith you became Christ, and by faith you are to grow up in him. Grow, keep growing, grow, grow, grow. Grow up in him by giving and taking. Giving and taking. You are to give all your heart, your will, your service. Give yourself to him to obey all his requirements, not just some of them, all. And you must take all, Christ, the fullness of blessing to abide in your heart, to be your strength, not your own, Christ in your heart, to be your strength, your righteousness, your everlasting helper, to give you power to obey. That's the secret. There it is. Back to our passage again. I read 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Let's go back to verse 14 in the same chapter now. It says, for the love of Christ constrains us. That word constrains means holds us. Right? When you're constrained, you're, you're controlled by God. The love of Christ constrains us. Love. To fall in love with Jesus. Wow. The love of Christ constrains us because we judge thus that if one Jesus died for all, then all died. In other words, he counts us all dead. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves. i got to stop again. You know, that's the problem, I think. We get so caught up with this world, the glamour, the cosmetics, the outward changes that we, society wants us to make, that we get it all turned around and we live for the world and not for him. You see, when Jesus died for us, he has a claim now on us. A legitimate claim. He made us, he redeems us, we're his. We have no right to go through life thinking, well, I'll do whatever I want to do. It's my own life. If we try it, it'll end up in disaster. We're to live for him. Many of us are afraid. Who? If I give Jesus everything, he might ask me to do something I don't want to do. Yes, he might. But if you really trust him, he'll change your heart so you want to do what you need to do. 
Amen? And by the way, he never wants you to do something that isn't for your best good or the best good of somebody else. Let me say that again. He's not going to ask you to do something that's not for your good or the good of somebody else. What did it say there? We should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. You know, when we live for Jesus, he takes us on a marvelous adventure. I never knew that when I was a boy raised in southern Manitoba, that he would take me, and I gave my life to him and became a minister, they'd take me all around the world. He'd take me up to Toronto to such wonderful people as here in Willowdale. He'd take me to India and the Philippines and Bulgaria and Romania. I never had a dream. Wow. If I had a life to live all over again, I'd live it for Jesus. Only I'd do, I think, a little better job because I've certainly failed along the way. Because I've learned some lessons in my few years of life. In the same chapter, would you go down to verse 18? Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself. He has already reconciled you, redeemed you, made you friends with himself. All you gotta do is accept it. He hasn't looked down and said, who are those bunch of sinners? No, he calls the saints. Amen. He's already reconciled him to himself through Jesus Christ. That's God doing it and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Oh, we're to help others. Wow, what a privilege, what a ministry. Can you imagine the joy I have when I have the privilege of baptizing a person like Muser? It's a joy, it's a joy. I have more joy than I think he does. I think so. To see someone give their life to Jesus? Wow. Ministry of Reconciliation. Verse 19 says, that is that God was in Christ, reconciling the world himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. No, he imputed his tre- your trespasses to Jesus. He put it all on Jesus. He doesn't count the sins against you. They're all in Jesus. Not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Now, what's an ambassador? Well, simple way that I look at it, an ambassador is the official representative from one government to another government. We send ambassadors to England, ambassadors to different countries. Official representatives of a country. We are official representatives of Jesus and his kingdom. Every one of us. Why do we get so caught up in the wrong things? Ah, glad you're patient, Lord, with us. So glad. Then it says, as through God, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. If there's anybody here that's not at peace with God, this is the time to bow your head, say, dear Jesus, please forgive me. I admit I'm a sinner. Come into my life. And then start living for him by faith. Amen? And then verse 21, this one of my favorite verses. For he made him. God the Father made Jesus. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, he didn't sin at all, to be sin for us. He took your sins and was treated on that cross as if he was sin. 
Did you get it? He died as a sinner, bearing the sins of the world. Your sins, my sins. What a Lord. Wow. He knew no sin, but God made him to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Moody once asked his audience, you've heard of Dwight L. Moody, a simple question. He held up a glass, an empty glass, and he said to his audience, how do I get the air out of this glass? How do I get the air out? And somebody said, well, maybe you can suction it out. Suck it out. Trouble is, when you do that, you're likely going to break the glass because it's a vacuum. How do you get the air out of that glass? And he reached over, took some water, and poured it into the glass, filled the glass. The air's gone, amen? How do we get sin out of our lives? Give them to Jesus, and then fill your life with Jesus. Day by day. Fill your life with Jesus. Live for him, and he'll bless you. I want to close this morning by giving you a five-word sermon that I hope you won't forget. Just five words. And originally, this sermon was preached by a guide in Mammoth Cave down in Kentucky. Any of you ever been to Mammoth Cave? Anybody ever been to Mammoth Cave? Down in Kentucky. It's a beautiful cave, big cave. Stalactites and all these things are there. There's a big cathedral room, huge room. Kind of an area for a pulpit. And you turn the lights out, ooh, it's dark, let me tell you. But the guide there stood behind the rock, kind of a pulpit, and said, here's the five words, keep close to your guide. I want to change it just a little bit, though. The five words I want to give you are keep close to Jesus. May God help you to do that day by day. May he live in your heart. And may he use you to proclaim his love to others. God bless you.